time we've started. Yeah, <laughs> four times is a charm. Um, I I'm really excited this uh, this win- Wellness Wednesday because um, a lot's been going on. Um, working with a lot of folks around the country. There's also a, a fair number of folks that are really taking a, a real deep dive into looking at policing. And I kept thinking the whole time, you know, people, we need to bring somebody on that knows. And I have my very dear friend, brother, really more like a brother to me, um, Dr. DeLacy Davis, uh, who I'm going to give him the opportunity to introduce himself and his years of service uh, in policing um, his current work. And I know he is got to be right now. His phone is ringing off the hook because he told everybody this years ago, years and years ago. Um, but, uh, I wanted to get to it and I'm going to show, I'm going to do a very short, a uh, kind of, uh, uh, PowerPoint to really kind of give people backgrounds into the history of policing. Um, and then move forward into what we're looking at because the questions that I know um, Dr. DeLacy uh, and I spoke about uh, early is just the whole idea of unions, who's in these unions, why they're so powerful and they're extraordinarily powerful, yes. um, the police union in particular. So when we start looking at change and we start looking at institutional stuff, we have to begin to look at the, what keeps these, these things in place, what is maintaining them. Um, and I don't think we've ever looked. I'd love to see a picture of who uh, is part of that union. Um, because again, uh, we cannot separate that from our history. Most people don't understand what's going on in this country because they don't understand our history. So I'm going to um, start with a PowerPoint. I'm not going to do all of it. I'm going to be jumping around. So I re- really wanted to help folks who are listening or paying attention on some level. I'm tr- there you go. Okay. The birth and development of the American police can be traced to a multitude of historical, legal, and political economic conditions. The institution of slave patrols and night watches, which later became modern police departments, were both designed to control the behavior of minorities. For example, New England settlers appointed Indian constables to police Native Americans, National Constable Association 1995. The St. Louis police were founded to protect residents from Native Americans in that frontier city, and many Southern police departments began as slave patrols. In 1704, the colony of Carolina developed the nation's first slave patrol. Slave patrols helped to maintain the economic order and to assist the wealthy landowners in recovering and punishing slaves who essentially were considered property. Um, Policing was not the only social institution enmeshed in slavery. Slavery was fully institutionalized in the American economic and legal order, with laws being enacted at both the state and national divisions of government. Virginia, for example, enacted more than 130 slave statutes between 1689 and 1865. Slavery and the abuse of people of color, however, was not merely a Southern affair, as many have been taught to believe. Connecticut, New York and other colonies enacted laws to criminalize and control slaves. Congress also passed fugitive slave laws, laws allowing the detention and return of escaped slaves in 1793 and 1850. As Turner Giacopassi and Vanderveer, 2006 remark, the literature clearly establishes that a legally sanctioned law enforcement system existed in America before the Civil War for the express purpose of controlling the slave population and protecting the interests of slave owners. The similarities between the slave patrols and modern American policing are too salient to dismiss or ignore. Hence, the slave patrol should be considered a forerunner of modern American law enforcement. Last quote, the legacy of slavery and racism did not end after the Civil War. In fact, it can be argued that extreme violence against people of color became even worse with the rise of vigilante groups who resisted reconstruction. Because vigilantes by definition have no external restraints, lynch mobs had a justified reputation for hanging minorities first and asking questions later. Because of its tradition of slavery, which rested on the racist rationalization that blacks were subhuman, America had a long and shameful history of mistreating people of color long after the end of the Civil War. Perhaps the most infamous American vigilante group, the Ku Klux Klan, started 
started in the 1860s, was notorious for assaulting and lynching black men for transgressions that would not be considered crimes at all had a white man committed them. Lynching occurred across the entire country, not just in the South. Finally, in 1871, Congress passed the Ku Klux Klan Act, which prohibited state actors from violating the civil rights of all citizens, in part because of law enforcement's involvement with the infamous group. Hmm. This legislation, however, did not stem the tide of racial or ethnic abuse that persisted well into the 1960s, we would say well into the 2020s. And I'm, I'm, I'm sharing this as a backdrop because once again, we are miseducated, uh, and not educated at all, or just simply ignoring the truth. Whatever the case, uh, we have to know that what people are calling uh, the recent um, killings as public uh, lynchings. Uh, but in reality, the police have carried out lynchings since the Civil War. They have carried them out. And I don't know what people think in their head when they think about white supremacy. I don't know what they think in their head when they look at racism. I don't know what they think in their head when they think about, you know, uh, police force or unions. But I don't think it's people in hoods. Let me show my book. This is Norm Stamper's book, and it's called Breaking Rank. Uh, and these are just a few quotes from him. Let me tell you a little bit about Norm. I have a great deal of respect for him. He was one of the people that talked about demilitarization of policing. And we're going to talk to DeLacy, to Dr. Uh, Davis about that um, in a moment. But he's a 34-year police veteran, retired chief of police for the cities of San Diego and Seattle wrote this book in 2005, really highly recommend that every black man, woman, and child have it, put it on the dash of your car, have it there, <laughs> because this is a man who spoke truth to power, uh, who was actually within the, um, the ranks of those powers. He said, I've heard some police officers refer to prostitute slayings or to the slayings of blacks as misdemeanor murders, employing an unofficial code for them, NHI, no human involved. San Diego cops confessed to myriad other acts of discrimination, including additional dehumanizing references to blacks on a radio call, for example, just in 1113. 1113 is a uh, nigger. Uh, it's a code for an injured animal, by the way, followed by a descriptor, dog, cat, skunk. Um, it was a pernicious form of discrimination injected with a large dose of misogyny. Let me stop for a minute here and say that anyone uh, certain professions draw certain personality types, right? It's like you always wonder why your hairdresser can't comb their hair. <laughs> Dennis has bad teeth. I, you know, I don't know what attracts people to things. Dennis has bad teeth. I don't know any Dennis with bad teeth. Well, my my Dennis had bad teeth. What? But maybe you know, maybe he had some issues. I don't know. Well, policing also attracts certain kind of personalities, and mm -hmm. one group of personalities is sociopaths. It attracts violent people. It should make sense, right? Which means that we need to really control for that. I don't think we are enough. Uh, I think we really need to check police, not just uh, in terms of the, whether or not they have racial bias. How about let's just check if they're crazy as hell to begin with. Okay, how about that? Why do you want to have a gun, all four foot 11 of you? Right. Norm Stamper talked about Amadou Diallo. And I really liked his assessment here. He says, Mr. Diallo was approached by four NYPD officers one night in February, 1999. Cops thought he might be a rape suspect, frightened, not understanding what was going on. Diallo reached for his wallet to show the officers his ID. One of the cops yelled gun. And in less time than it takes to read this sentence, 41 shots were fired, 19 of them striking Mr. Diallo. Diallo was not a rapist. In fact, he had no criminal record. NYPD ruled it a, quote, clean shooting, meaning the killing of the 22-year-old non-English speaking unarmed immigrant was legally justified and within department policy. The Department of Justice found no civil rights violations. A state criminal trial ended in four acquittals. But an innocent man was shot dead. Why? Because that Mr. Diallo was Black. I believe the cops were afraid of him for that reason and that reason alone. So frightened they couldn't see straight, think straight, shoot straight. If they'd been at their PD firearms range in the Bronx, all 41 of those shots fired as they were at point blank range would have found their target. To determine whether the Diallo killing or any other police action was racially motivated, you have to ask, 
would the cops have behaved the same way if the man had been white? No. Diallo was killed because of his dark skin. A white man reaching for his wallet under identical circumstances, including a language barrier, would have been given the benefit of the doubt. Simply put, white cops are afraid of black men. We don't talk about it. We pretend it doesn't exist. We claim color blindness. We say white officers treat black men the same way they treat white men, but that's a lie. In fact, the bigger, the darker the black man, the greater the fear. The African-American community knows this. Hell, most whites know it. Yet even though it's a central, if not the defining ingredient in the makeup of police racism, white cops won't admit it to themselves or to others. Last quote from him. Race and class discrimination are all too real in every phase of the criminal justice system from arrests to sentencing. Impoverished black defendants are far more likely to wind up on death row than rich or middle-class whites. Black defendants are not accorded the same due process rights as whites. Their cases are not given the same scrutiny and consideration afforded white defendants. Not now, not ever, not in this country. That's a 34 year police veteran, white man, who is making that statement after those 34 years. Racism is baked into the foundation of policing in America. Say that again. Racism Ooh. is baked into the foundation of policing in America. That is not to imply as evidence by Norm Stamper that all white cops are bad. And it certainly does not imply that all black and brown cops are good. That's right. right. Because it is the culture of the organization that mm -hmm. is rotten to its core. Culture, Not so much the race of the people, the culture. But the culture was, was put together by thieves and bandits and criminals. And they've taken everything they've ever wanted. And so when they put the police force together, um, not only was it, I mean, they had the, um, the patty rollers, as, as the slaves referred to them as. The patty rolls would come and grab you. And not only could they grab you, but they could beat you up to 39 licks. Each time they got you, you don't you begin to see black police officers in this country in 1805 as the watchmen, as the guard in Louisiana. However, they were not allowed to arrest white people. They couldn't wear their gun and uniform around white people. And in fact, when you begin to see the formalized police structure in this country, it's around 1913. And Mr. Forgey would wear his uniform, but only at parades because he was a black officer. So, and so we're getting ready to face with um, the defunding movement, um, with folks wanting to either disband or change the structure of policing, wanting more oversight over policing, which I happen to agree with some of it. What's going to happen is you're seeing union bosses stand up like grand wizards. And let me say that again. Union bosses are standing up like grand wizards and they're declaring that somehow they're being mistreated. The reality is that generally the unions, while they're nonprofits, they're 501c4s, which mm -hmm. means that the primary work they do is for their membership. Right. The nonprofits, as we know in our, in our community, are 501c3s, which means the primary work that you do is for the community, mm -hmm. which our organization is a C3. So what I tell the community is that you, you're under an illusion if you think the union that gets its money, its wealth, and its power from its membership is going to somehow turn on the people that feed it. Right. So it's become a monster, a bohemian, and it's got a, a arm, a political arm that is very powerful. And it's aligned with both parties of the government, which is why people don't rise up on them. And so what our community is getting ready to face, and for I think for the first time in my history, I'm seeing white kids on the front line with everyone else because they're also sick and tired of it. But what's going to happen is the cops are fighting back. Even since the death of Mr. Floyd, they're still beating, putting their feet on people, kicking people, beating people and maiming people because they really don't give a damn. And what they're angry about is that how dare you have the nerve to say it hurts and cry more than a day or two about it. We generally have been studied by the FBI, their behavioral science unit that says that black people are only going to scream and yell for about two, three days, and then we're going to go back to normal. And we've seen that most of the time when people have been killed in our community. But this time it's different because we're around day 14 and people are still protesting and they're taking turns protesting. Whether it's my mestizo sister that called me from 
um, Victoria, Texas, last week saying, last night saying, Mr. Davis, I need you to mentor and guide me because we did a protest expecting 200 people and a thousand showed up. And I said, of course, sister, we will. Or whether it's African Americans or most recently in Franklin Township, which is down by New Brunswick, where you were when you were at Princeton, um, a biracial young lady team had a demonstration. She marched 75 people, I think, through Franklin Township, and white counter protesters were there with a white guy on the ground with somebody's foot on his knee on his neck, and they were shouting all sorts of stuff at them. But one was a correction officer who mm. just got suspended. He just got suspended. Yeah, I saw that. How, how could it? So that's what we're up against. What's happening is that particularly the white men that control the apparatus are feeling threatened mm -hmm. and feel like they have to fight back. What concerns me and has all is the black and brown officers that have not found the testicular fortitude to stand up. It's hard, it's difficult, but it requires courage. And if you don't have the courage, then you need to join Dorothy, the scarecrow, the lion, and the tin man to go wait, to the wizard. Wait, did you say, just so I'm clear, did you say testicular fortitude? Like the I balls? Did. The balls? I did. That was yes. it. Tahoni, That's yes. what I'm going to start saying. Show some testicular fortitude. That's what I need you to do. It's critical. Because what I've said, and, 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 and Dr. Joy has been very supportive of me over the last 20 years, and I'm grateful because when I got ready to get this doctor, you said, we need you here. And we'll do whatever we need to do to support you. Well, that's what we're expecting. When they bring their guns against our community, we're expecting our officers, our experts, our people who know better to have the courage to stand up and band together and say, no, we're not going to allow you to do that in our community. Right. You know, when Lionel Tate, the 12-year-old, did the wrestling move and accidentally killed his six-year-old cousin, Tiffany Eunuch, down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida in 2001, I didn't know Lionel or his mother. A guy that I locked up for drugs introduced me to the mother. We flew in. We watched him get sentenced to life. The youngest person in the history of the United States at 12 sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. When Judge Lazar, I was sitting in the courtroom and I was still an active duty officer and I didn't understand natural life. I'm like, you mean for real? Like you're giving up on this kid at 12? And we have to fight back. We designed this reentry plan. We organized people. We went to Rome to meet with the Pope. We did everything we could because it could have been any of our children. And so when you lack the, the basic humanity and decency and the depravity for life, as we saw with this guy, with Mr. Floyd, there's something sick about you. And when folks of goodwill of any race can't find the courage to speak up loudly and forcefully, especially with the occupant or 1600, okay, Black Lives Matter Plaza. <laughs> okay, when you don't find the, the capacity to speak up, clearly we're in danger. My grandmother was born 1901, died 1982, the youngest of 10 children. All her aunts and uncles were slaves. I'm the fifth generation of my family, Professor Gable Day in Loudoun County, Virginia, 1818 to 1895. So he came through slavery, and the fact that he was a professor means he could read and write which was dangerous then. We're getting ready to see night Riders in the daytime. Mm -hmm. We're getting ready to see folks really unleashed. They're not going to have on hoods. They're walking out front, calling it what it is. White folks are calling me saying, Delacy, what can we do? Talk to your cousins. Exactly. Okay. That's what I said today. Today, yes. call your uncle. Don't talk They're to calling me from people. all over the country because this is, this is systemic. Right. These are these are not this is beyond microaggression. This is the system. This is Dr. Um, this is Dr. Francis Francis Cress Wellsing. These are the keys to the colors, the ISIS papers, the nine people area activities that are that are based on white supremacy. And we either have to go into the institutions to dismantle them or try to reform them. I'm not hopeful in the reform, but I believe they need to be dismantled. Now, the problem is. If we defund all the police departments, now the only city that I've known in recent time to do is Camden, New Jersey, but you, we're African people and just the principles of my art require balance. So if you take something away, you've got to put something back. And so even in Camden, they disbanded the local police force, but they rebuilt a county one, mm. which reduced crime and complaints. But if you disband the police force, and I don't know who started de um, defunding but if you disband the police force in my neighborhood, I got some cousins, Pookie and Peaches, and then there's hoping the police don't come out. <laughs> so, so we've got to also balance that for our community. Who's going to secure it? 
Who's going to protect the women, the children, and the elders? That's right. That's right. We don't want teachers out there either. I think too, too uh, what, when what you speak to is so important. Um, I'm always thinking uh, because people are always, you know, especially young people, and I'm really trying to encourage and work with them. I will work with young people forever. But if you old and you don't, you haven't figured it out, don't call me now. <laughs> don't just, you know, do some reading. But I, I'm not dealing with you. I'm dealing with young people who may not know. Um, but what, what, what my first question always is, there's this kind of, again, there's this invisible picture of the union. And I'm sorry, I get traumatized when I just hear it, right? Police and union together, what goes on in my body isn't good. I have nothing to base that on, except that there are these invisible powers that have maintained the current structure to date. Absolutely. So who are they? Why don't we see their faces and pictures? And like you're saying, when uh, and what we were talking about earlier is the fact that we are doing good work. But here you're doing good work. Um, sorry. Ooh, that was me. Oh, my bad. That my bad. Was me. I'm so bad when you talk about me. If that was me, so bad. <laughs> I, I feel bad. I'm turning my phone off. Okay. Um, the issue has been that when I'm talking to young folks and they're trying to figure out, well, what can we do, Dr. Joy? What we what can we do? Well, there's lots we can do. We'll talk about that towards the uh, towards the end. But what we have to understand is the structure that we're up against. And yeah. everybody out there, thank God that folks are waking up. I'm very happy. I don't mean to be in any way critical of that. I think it's important. Whatever time you wake up, thank God for it. But do understand that these systems are in place, have been in place for legacies. Yes. These are generations of people. My granddaddy, his daddy, his daddy, his mama, all of us put this in place. It's not going away. So we do good work in spite of the systems, yes. not because of them. Yes. And that's the difference. Everybody's looking like, I remember I was telling uh, the Lacey, you know, when OJ, the whole OJ thing happened, right? The whole country was up in arms. And I think black people thought, you know, basically what, what, uh, C Corcoran did what he Cochran did is he basically utilized the same laws and tripped them up on their own laws. That's that's yeah. how he won the case. But the bottom line is black folks were like, yeah, we're gonna start getting justice. No, oh. as a matter of fact, everything it went backwards from there. It went backwards from there. And 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 again, it says, yeah, we get to use these laws, we get to manipulate systems and power and people in power, but you don't. Right. You don't. It does not work the same way for anyone going into the system. Uh, most of the folks I know, I know some young folks that just became attorneys. I know some older attorneys that are leaving law, right? Both of these things are happening at the same time. Um, and yeah, we need you there. My gosh, we need, we definitely need black police officers. But what I wanted to ask you specifically, DeLacy, in my mind, as a clinician, right? There is there there are very very effective, very very accurate bias detectors. We've done all kind of you know there's all kind of testing, right? Mm -hmm. And we can test for bias and specifically police bias. There's been a whole body of research looking at police. So here's my question: You want to be a police officer? God bless you. Okay. You learn all the tactical stuff, stuff. And of course, Norm Stamper says they're taught in the academy that the enemy is black men. Right. So now you got captains, lieutenants, sergeants. That sounds like war <laughs> to me. That I mean, it just sounds like you're in a war. Um, so why that? Why are you a sergeant? Does that mean me as a citizen? I'm the enemy. But the question is, if I can test for bias, stay with me. I can test for bias rather accurately. Matter of fact, we can even address and reverse bias. We have enough research now. They've basically looked at virtual reality being able to reduce bias in one setting by like 40%. So, what, so we know we can do that. So I'm saying, first of all, why isn't that mandatory, especially if you're carrying a gun? Why isn't it mandatory that any human being carrying a gun has to be tested for this level of bias because we know the outcome? Why, number one, and then let's say you have bias. We go, poor thing, black, because trust me, it doesn't matter what color you are. 
people, we've all been trained to look at this, socialized to look at black people as, as enemies. And black skin is, is not, you know, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a crime having black skin. But what, what my question is, is if we can test for bias, we find out you have bias. And we say, you know, here's the thing. We're going to need you to do some work. We got some, some work to do with you. But until you get to the, uh, the, the level where you, you won't maybe do harm, in other words, you'll see, really see a soda can instead of a gun. <laughs> maybe you'll see, you know, the, I don't know, candy instead. But, so until then, though, you don't get to, to work in the black community. You don't get to work in communities of color. Now, I'm not mad at you. You work on it. You get better. But right now, based on what we see, you don't get to show up. How hard is that? Right? If I don't, trust me, if I'm in medical school and I'm not passing classes, I don't get to cut people open. That's right. And so my question is, we have the apparatus in place. We have the capacity. We even have the training to remediate this. Why is it everybody gets to come on in the community? Have have That's what I need to know. You have to have the will. And, and, and what do you, well, let me let Dr. DeLacy respond. So remember we talked about the power of um, unions. And just as this government is precluded and prevented from studying um, gun, guns and shooting people and tracking it because of the NRA, Police departments are not even moving in the direction of understanding that because that would then require you to identify people and the union's job is to protect its membership. And so they will tell you, as you heard um, with um, Bill Barr um, this week, say there is no um, systemic racism. Um, it's just a few bad apples. And of course, that's what I say when they ask why people are burning down the country. I said, no, they're not burning down the country. It's just a few bad apples. So <laughs> let's get to the core issues because those are bad apples, right? Because if I can, if you want me to accept your bad apples, you got to accept these from the community. The, the reality is that if we look for it, we'll find it. It's kind of like testing, right? If you test for bias, you'll find bias. But if I don't test for it and I don't find it, I can continue to deny that it exists. Right. That's number one. Then you've got the bargaining rights. And I was a union rep, so let me be honest, right? So you've got bargaining rights, but the union is not going to expose its membership. So, and, and let me just point out, I'll, I'll name Trenton, not recently, but in the last 20 years, um, the union in Trenton voted out the black officers that were speaking up. Okay? The, so I was the, re the regional representative for the National Black Police Association. Bowles, the Brother Officers Law Enforcement Society. Lemmy Cavers was the president. Carol Russell, who I'm still friends with, was the treasurer. And Lafayette Supton. They stood up in the meeting to challenge the union on behalf of the Black community in Trenton, New Jersey. The union then called the vote to vote their Black behinds out of the union. And they still were able to take 85% of the dues because they negotiate contracts for them. So, so now you're in a catch-22. Now you're no longer in the union, which means if you make a mistake, no one's defending you. But you're still paying me part of your pay because you get a contract. So that's the complexity you got there. That's why you don't see anyone studying bias and saying, let's work on this. That's a whole nother approach. It's a holistic approach. And it makes sense, right? Because men, people make mistakes. Police are not even, you You will rarely hear law enforcement say, we made a mistake. Ever. Because it is paramilitary. They're taught not to retreat. We're taught not to trust anybody. So you, you, if you're not crazy, you will be by the time you finish the academy and get through the first two or three years. And then after you go through the academy, they give you a field training officer who says, forget everything you learned in the academy. Let me show you how it's really done. And so you got group Wait, think going uh, on. What'd you say, Bahia? Is there any way to incentivize? Because you said that the union is designed to protect its members. Mm -hmm. So is there any way? So if the members, so for instance, if if we were if we were able to be effective in having some, not just um, in getting some convictions for these folks who've been charged, right? If we That's were an incentive. Then part of it would be to protect our members. Maybe in the training process, we have to build in. 
But do you think that that just still has to happen? You have to have will to want that to happen. So you, 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 you and my sister are smarter than me. So how do we train a racist or untrain one? Well, I, well, the thing that we've seen success in, like, and I guess I, I think about engaging people at the heart place, right? Because you can't change behavior. I don't believe in that without changing seriously hearts and minds. I don't believe hearts and minds have changed unless you have experience, which is why the virtual reality thing was so effective because people feel like they're in this situation where they have to be helped by black people. So black right. person, they're, they're, they're living or dying is dependent on black people. And those scenarios where they feel like it's a life or death situation, it cuts through all those layers of, I think, epigenetically um, uh, implanted apathy for us. I think it cuts through all those layers. And you're muted, lady. I don't know what you're saying. I was just rep repeating the epigenetic apathy. Woo. It's, I, you know what I'm saying? It's multiple layers. So I think that the only way that that happens is if I feel like you meet people who are like not religious, who when they're about to die, they're like, Jesus, you know, like, oh my God, of God save me. I feel like that's the same thing. It's like when you're in that moment where you feel like I'm going to die, but the, the key to me living is this black person. It breaks through all those layers, I feel like. And the more of those kinds of interactions that people have, I mean, that's usually when you think Norm Stamper, I'm sure something happened with him on a person to person level that he felt it through all those layers and said, this is some, I can't even live with myself if I don't do something different. So let's use that as an example. There's 18,000 police departments, roughly 800,000 to a million police officers. How many norms do you know? <laughs> also, right? uh, will you speak to the picture behind you? Um, you and you explained it to me, but so, it, it, it looks so like the, a gun pointing at him, but it's- it's, so a, it's actually a diploma pointing at a black male blindfolded with the flag. And that is um, an, a, a, art, a piece painted by the artist Baja, who's from here in New Jersey. And it's called Ahmed, which means high praise, but it, he really uses it as an acronym for American education. And he talks about the racism that's in the educational system and that when a black person is blind, they're blindfolded getting the education and the diploma blows their brains out because it has nothing to do with who we really are. Woo! But we brought into it and we do everything to get that diploma. See, this is why I know he's your friend. See, this is what yeah. I was saying. My, <laughs> so this is the thing when, when I'm sitting next to her and she's reading some horrible, horrible, terrible graphic book that's going to make me want to jump off a bridge. And I told him, I said, I need to come home to the African queen Zen lady. I can't look at the man shooting his brains out with a diploma. That is so <laughs> rough. <laughs> that's why y'all friends, because y'all like that. Uh, there was, there was a, a gentleman, and I mentioned it before, I heard him saying it, that they were interviewing this young brother who had just gotten his master's degree. And he said, it didn't occur to me until now, because he's, he's in the protest marching, he said, that I was chasing that degree to try to outrun racism. And then I realized it was a race I could never win. Mm. That's literally the words of this young man that he was chasing that degree to try to outrun racism. Not a, not a, not a race he could win. But it's, it's for me, you know, I, I hear what you're saying and, I, and I'm so appreciative. Uh, and again, we have, you know, black scientists, black uh, attorneys, we have folks that are really looking at this issue from every side. And so what would you, what would you say to young people now, everybody who's pensive waiting for these verdicts, you know, Brother Joggin, one doesn't matter, you know, Brianna, you, you know, what, what are you, everybody's poised waiting for these um, verdicts, so to speak, what's going to end up really happening, uh, like the police officer that shot um, Oscar Grant, mm -hmm. he, he, I think he spent all of 30 days. Mm -hmm. He was handcuffed on his face and he said he accidentally shot him thinking he was tasing him. So here's my question. He's handcuffed on his face with a police officer holding him down. Why would you need to tase him? You wouldn't. Unless so even if you were trying to tase him and you thought you reached for your taser and it was a gun and you shot him dead, is it just oops? I mean, it you is. know, it, it was. Th those are the kind of things, and he and the guy who emptied his gun on the man he asked to get his his uh, Orlando uh, uh, Cassidy. How how do you do that in front of everybody and get exonerated? 
it's, it's a wanton disregard. Well, that's what Norm talked about, um, the disparity in the system at every level. It's a wanton disregard for human life when it's black, brown, and poor life. Um, and that happens. Uh, that's why I asked right here, how many norms do you know? I, the, the, the reality is that there, there is group think. People do go along to get along. One of the things I would say to young people is that, you know, the question used to be asked, what time is it? It's nation time. Um, we need Black Wall Street. We need to control our economics. We need to re recognize that voting is a tool that we can use because all politics is local, but we need to control the apparatus. You, you know, those children that I tell you told you about that I adopted, we were also able to get $1.5 million out of Washington, D.C. because a young brother down there told me how to get an earmark and bring it back home and not let it go through the city. And then I put 20 young people on a committee to decide how the money would be spent since I got it on their backs, right? We, we need the wealth to be accumulated and then we need to develop our own resources. I, I believe that institutionalized racism requires an institutionalized response, Absolutely. not begging you to let me in your institution. Let us build ours. OK, let us do business. I got someone asked me about Black Tuesday. Well, Delacia, are you going to black out? No, I'm not. Why? Because if I'm going to take myself out of the larger society on a Tuesday because I'm black, then I'm going to put myself into a black community because I'm black and spend my black dollars with a black business. That's the beauty institution. How are you going to do part of the struggle? Just disappearing means nothing. You then got to put your resources in your community with people who look like you. And that's the piece that's missing. The black church has got, I mean, they make the largest deposit of any bank on, on I mean, any institution in our community in the bank on Monday morning. And so you got to be leading the charge, whether, you, whether you're the church, the mosque, the masjid, or the temple. These are institutions where our people are. And so why aren't you on the front line defending? Why aren't you leading the charge? Why aren't you, since you got the connection to God, then letting God speak to you in front of the children at these demonstrations all across the country? Mm -hmm. These are institutions that are failing. The, the educational system. Why do we in our educational system have all the young white girls in the inner city? No, let her work in your neighborhood, in the <laughs> suburb. Let her teach your children. Not that they can't teach, but our children are getting the least educated teachers. We're getting the worst food. We're living on food deserts. We don't have anything that looks like real food. Everything is artificial. And then we're wondering what's going on in our community. We have failed this generation of young people, and especially around law enforcement. Because I know, and I've said this, it's not going to be black men. It's going to be black women that lead the charge because the brothers are scared to death. Sisters will stand up. Carrie O'Horn is a black female officer in 2006 that was on a job where her white partner had arrested someone and was proceeding to choke him while he was handcuffed. She jumped on his back to get him off this black man. He flipped her, punched her in her face, wrote her up. They charged her and she lost her pension in her 19th year. She's still out in the street fighting. Why? Tell me why no millionaire black person anywhere on the earth said Let's give this sister a platform. Let's make sure her and her three children are taken care of. Let's make sure she can eat. This is what I mean by the institution. They saw it happen. And so now I'm not surprised that the 75-year-old white guy that gets pushed down, busts his head, and he's bleeding out the ear. The police report initially said that he tripped because I guess they didn't know there was video, right? So they, they get taught to test the lie. Now the video shows up, and then Mayor Brown, a black guy who's just, who might as well be beige, he comes on TV and try to sell the story to the community that, well, you know, it, things were moving quickly and we didn't have accurate details. Are you kidding me? No, they lied. I don't care how quickly things were moving. You know the difference between a trip and I pushed them. <laughs> and so this is also what's going on, because what happens, we've got black actors in front of the game playing along. Right. They're playing along with the game. And, and so our community is under siege. Um, I love the young people out in the street because they've got the heart, they've got the courage, and they are fearless. Now, my concern is three weeks from now to see who comes up with the virus. That concerns me because they're, and, and some of the young people that I talked to said, listen, if I'm going to die with, by somebody's knee in my neck or the virus, I'll take my chances with the virus. But that's a hell of a choice to have to make when the adults who claim to be smart, commonsensical people have not stepped up. In fact, the late Amiri Baraka used to say to us when we'd sit and listen to him, he said, if the chair that you've been sitting your behind in, your stinking dirty behind in, if the chair had half the brain that you claim to have, when the chair sees you coming again, 
before it would let you put your behind in its face, it would fold up and wrestle you to the ground. Yet you let people come in your community, pull their pants down, crap on you and your children, and you do nothing about it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should say how you really feel. Uh, <laughs> this, this, is what I'm gonna, this is what I'm thinking though too, is I think that this is very inspiring because I do think that people are afraid. And I think that they're trying to manage. They've got all these things they're trying to manage. I work for, I have an organization that I run called the Black Parent Initiative, and we're doing all that we can to make sure that families thrive, right? Yeah. The problem is, and this is why I told this group of people today, I have a lot of white guilt conversations on a regular basis. Everybody wants to you know, ask questions right now. Uh, what can I do? What can I do? And just like you said, I started saying, this, I, work with a, I was working with a group today that it's, it's mostly retired, rich, um, basically they're like um, formerly, CEOs, the retired folks that basically have been lending their support to nonprofit organizations um, to try to help them grow. And they've been with our organization for about four years. Um, social venture partnerships, I'll just say that to them, the, the SVP. So they've been working, they have their issues, but they've been working with us for about four years. And I will say that I was talking to a group of their members and people were asking, well, what can we do? What does BPI, what does BPI need the most? And I said, do we, what do we need the most for our families? Or what do we need the most for our organization? Because we're doing all that we can for our families. You can't help us unless you're going to give us more money, which we always right. welcome more money. Black Parent Initiative, plug, we need more money. Um, but when it comes to our organization, we need you to navigate for us out here where people are trying to disparage the work that we're trying to do and undermine us. You need to be able to, to tackle conversations on spheres of influence that you, on a day-to-day -day basis, and push the, curi push the curiosity of your fellow retirees around how is it that we should be doing something, using our, our new information to shift the system, to, to question some of these policies, to consider how the impact might be, not just our intentions as a large organization or philanthropic organization, like what is the impact of these policies that we have some influence over? And so when you start doing that in your own circles, that benefits us. You don't, I don't need you to come help me directly work with my people. I don't need you to do that. I need you to work with your people, which you don't want to do. And they're all like, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk to my cousin. They don't want to do that. But I said, but that's where those people who are making those decisions, where you have some, some level you know, of, of influence, that's where I need you to put your energy. So when I'm thinking about norm stampers or the, the, the latent norms, the ones that are out there that feel some kind of way, but haven't done anything yet. Right. I think that, that what you're doing and, and, and the platforms like this, maybe, maybe can inspire them to say, this man has been in the ranks. He's been there. He's He's been, put his life on the line. He loves his community. And that was my thing. I love my community so much. I love us. And I, I don't want us, the biggest fear for me is that we start to buy the lie completely. We mm. deserve to die. We aren't worth anything. We don't matter. That is my, so I'm constantly working overtime to, to, to push away that narrative while everything is count, all evidence to the contrary, right? right? I'm constantly trying to push that we are valuable and that we are important and that, that our lives matter. But you know what I'm hoping that this does is that what your knowledge and expertise and experience and passion and really, frankly, love for our community is what I hope inspires those those norms that are just like, should I, could I, to say, I don't have any way that I can. And they're out there. They are. They're out there. I've had white officers call me, even when I was on the job, they said, let me tell you something. We have so much respect for you because you're standing up for your community because we as white officers would never let black officers do any of what we see our colleagues doing in your community. Well, you couldn't do it to our children. And black officers know it. That's why we don't shoot Susie. We ain't playing with Tomboy. We listen, we don't even shoot them when they got guns. I've seen white guys with guns and the cops still talk to them. And that's what I saw in my study. In my study, I had a scenario with a white woman with a gun in a custody dispute. She got a baby in her arm and she's fighting with the ex-husband. She pulls a gun and shoots him. Even in that scenario, it took cops almost eight seconds to shoot her. But a black male passenger that pulled the gun out, shot him in 0. 0.51 seconds. White guy pulled a gun, 0. 0.25 seconds. So there's implicit bias. And so what we know is that we've got to give permission Two things. One is the guilty folks. We got to just say, we forgive you. Right now, let's go do something in your community and do something meaningful because there's, there's work to be done. And, and I tell people and young people, pick any one of those nine people area activities 
and decide to devote your life to doing the work there, right? Mm -hmm. I just happen to be in a couple of them and y'all are in a couple of them, but you don't have to pick all of them, just pick one. Whether it's politics, law, education, labor, whatever. War, pick your, take your pick, but we gotta stand up. And that's my appeal to our community. Let's stop giving money to the safe organizations. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that young people get a voice. Let's push young people up. Like I'm mentoring, I thought I was gonna be done with mentoring, right? I'm still mentoring and coaching. I'm mentoring people older than me, younger than me. You know, <laughs> you, you know I'm like, well, what do I do? And, and, and you know, my friend looks at me like, what are you doing? I'm doing the work. And, and because we have to do it, you know, grandma did this. Grandma would talk to us all day and night, cooking and talking, cooking and talking. And, and we've got to return that. Like, it's not a meal eating a fast food thing, right? Cook, sit down, have a discussion and prepare them for the future because our young people are up against a monster. It's a demon. And the only, the safe, the saving grace right now is that the entire country is mobilized and they're protesting. But if this were different and white kids weren't on the front lines, we'd have been mowed down. Right. And our children would be mowed down. And so their outrage, we need to be equally outraged and we got to continue to do this work. Well, we have a couple questions before we go because we're oh. back to our time, but we got some questions. So um, one person said, um, how, well, how do we push past the performative activism that's happening now and get down to the real work? So when you talked about actors and everything who are, participating in this showcasing of these things. Um, you know, what, what is your message for folks um, to get down to the real world? What do they need to be doing? Well, they need, to, they need to identify each community has a right to determine how it should be policed. And so once you come together with your community leaders, formal and informal, and you decide what you think policing should look like in your community, go to work. Put your bucket down right where you are and go to work. And so that's what you can do because it's, it's, it's not easy lifting. So if you don't like the elected officials and run for office, you know, as Kwame Torre said, I heard him in his last lecture here in Newark, New Jersey. I was a young officer. He didn't even know I was an officer in the audience, but I was there trying to learn. And he says, every black person should belong to an organization. And if it's a weak organization, make it stronger. And if you can't make it stronger, start your own. And then after you start your own, you got to ask the question about Africa. See, once we finish fighting here, we got some other work to do. There are resources that are being gobbled up by everybody but us. We have no linkage to our heritage and to our people. And so I'm saying start where you are, start small. For some of the young people, run for office. Why is it only white kids that run for office at 19 and 20 and we celebrate them like they've accomplished something great? They don't know anything at 19 any more than our 19 year olds, but our 19 year olds have lived experience. And so why aren't we supporting them? Why do we have folks in the Democratic Party that have been here, they, they done turned green, they still hobbling along wanting to stay in seats of power instead of elevating young people so they can bring in fresh ideas, make change and do something different. That's what I say to the folks out there, Whatever it is you want to do, whether it's education, law enforcement, make a change. Yes. Okay. Another question for you. Somebody said, so is there an action plan? Somebody's down. They want to get going right now. They said, like a literal, this is what to do. You gave us that. It said Black group economics, Black patrolling. Um, somebody else asked, um, how long is the general police training in the U.S.? So those are general police training, generally speaking, is about 19 to 22 months, unless you're at the state police, which is six months because they live at the barracks. But those that are in local police departments, somewhere between 19, 22 months, 22 weeks, and then you actually go to your agency and you get another two to four weeks of in-house training to get you ready for the streets. Now, what I will say is there's also some agencies, um, the, the Keystone Cop agencies, where you get deputized and you don't get the training until training is available. So you could be walking around with a gun and a badge and no training beyond the in-house stuff. I'm just saying, I'm just telling you what exists. Yes, oh. that, that does exist. All right, that's rough. Okay, um, uh, but in terms of uh, black patrolling and black group economics, um, in terms of what do you do first? What do you think? You, I know you said start where you are, but I, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's both and. I think there's nine areas to work in, right? And they're interdependent. So you can pick where you want to be, whether it's in law. I mean, so the law enforcement spectrum is everything. Whether the police put you in the system and then you got everybody. You got the lawyers, you got the prosecutor, you got public defenders, you got the judges, you got the clerks. I mean, I've had help at every stage because people knew that something was amiss. Right. So that's part of that equation. Um, I think economics is important because it controls the game. 
The mm-hmm. union, if the union wasn't putting money in the game, they wouldn't have any influence on politicians. Mm-hmm. That's just the way it is. The, the, the Republicans that are silent on the occupant at 1600 Black Lives Matter Plaza are not silent accidentally. They're silent because he has the capacity to harm them both with his base and with dollars because they won't let dollars get made for them. So you got to use your money strategically. We've got to save money. We have to invest money and we have to invest in ourselves and institutions in our community intentionally. All righty, our last question, because you're like hammering it down. You know, first of all, I think we should share that uh, Dr. DeLacy was in the bed and was like retiring when he decided to pop out on behalf of mom. And I was like, I mean, why would you get out of bed to do this with us? And um, that's where I was gonna say, my little words of encouragement is to make strong bonds of friendship with people who are who are active and interested in being in the struggle with you. Because absolutely, it's not thing to be doing it by yourself. So but when I was under siege, no. your mother was called in the late '90s, and she flew into town. She was at the peak of who she was, and the book was doing great. And she started not robbery to come to my aid. They held something for me in Brooklyn, New York, and I, I was in tears. One that she showed up. And two, that she was there to defend me. And, and I recognize that if it were not for me, with my struggle for black women, my mama was a black woman, my grandmama, my grandmama's mama, and I honor black women. And it has been black women that have gone to the front lines every time I was under siege. And so I owe that, and I have to give that back every day in honor of the black women who birthed me and the black women who defended me. So I got up. She said, well, what are you doing? I said, well, I was asleep, but I'm getting up now because I'm up at 4.30 in the morning. She said, really? Because I was hoping Wednesday was next week. She's like, no, I need you in an hour. I'll be there. <laughs> and you do that. And I think that that's the other piece of this, right? The level of commitment. We can't be engaged in the struggle when it's convenient. We also have to be engaged in the struggle when it's inconvenient because it's important. You know, I used to tell folks, if they shoot Pookie and Peaches in the cold or the winter, Black people not coming out. Right. We're like, it's too cold to march. It's, it's raining. I ain't getting out in the rain, mess up my hair. You know, I got to give these Koreans more of this nine hundred dollar hair than I'm buying from them as opposed to buying it from black vendors. A whole nother piece, the economics. Right. Go ahead. I'm, go ahead. Buddy. Okay. You got one more. Right. I know we got. We, first of all, let me just say this. This is not the last time you're going to be on here. Uh oh, uh oh. We've only we've only scratched the surface. So, you know, yeah. I'm not saying don't go to bed early. I'm just saying. <laughs> Be aware, and you know how we roll. They happened today. We were yeah. like, yeah. I, called, I called him just a couple hours ago. I, know, I, I, I and I was just hoping he was gonna pick up. You know, I was going, you know, just go so with it. No, let me tell you what she did by here. She called and then called back because <laughs> I was laying down. I said, Well, whoever called twice mean they want to talk. Let me look. And then I saw it was her. I said, I gotta answer this call. Look, yeah. I couldn't even fake it out. <laughs> I love it. Okay, so the last question. Um, that we have for tonight. I know we have lots of questions for you and you have been such an inspiration tonight. I know people are uplifted by your brilliance and your passion um, for our community. And we need that. We need that. People, it's like, it's like vitamins, right? We all need that to strengthen us. So I just appreciate you. It's like a protein drink. I feel like I had a protein (laughs) shake. I know, right? Uh, It's like, I'm ready to go. Um, uh, Keisha asks, um, why do you think it, the church isn't leading in the fight against racism? So I think that we've become, in our, and I grew up in the church, but I think we've become comfort corrupt. Um, I know that um, we, when, you, when you preach a prosperity theology and the only one that's prospering is you, <laughs> I'm just saying, right? That's my thought, right? It's very difficult to come out front lines when you've got four, five, 20,000 people who are struggling. And you tell them they're struggling because God just hasn't blessed them yet. No, tell the people the truth. In fact, some of the churches, because of the pandemic, are folding because nobody's tithing in some places, right? Because now you got to really convince people to invest. And so I think that there are some churches that we've collaborated with that do the work. Certainly, we here in Newark, I work with um, Muhammad's Mosque 25, and we work with the mosque in Plainfield, and we work with churches all around. But there are also some that have not done the work in a meaningful way because, you know, whether it's the Negroes that were standing with the occupant in the White House and they were Negroes. Right. I mean, you have a right to to vote however you like, but you are leading people astray when you are telling people with a straight face and and you're in black face because you're black. Right. A straight face that this man has done more for black people than anybody else in the presidency. There's something wrong with you. 
There's absolutely something. So I think that we've led people astray. I mean, black women still struggle in the church. I've got friends, Dr. Nicole Simpson, who just got her doctorate with me. She was at Boston College. She struggled in the black church in that she has her own now, but black preachers wouldn't let her in the door. And she's a certified financial planner. Most of her clients are rich people, the kind of people you talk to by here, but she couldn't get the church to open the door so she could come in and teach people how to save their money, teach people how to build wealth, how to pass generational wealth on and on so that we can survive. Like, for example, if you know you get ready to check out, right? I, I, I got to tell you, this. if you know you're checking out and you got insurance policy or like me, you got a pension for life, marry me, right? Or marry somebody so the money stays in the community. That's what other people do. <laughs> yeah, that's what they do. Leave the wealth in the community. I talked to a guy the other day, one of my relatives, I think he's angry with me, but he'd fallen off the wagon for the second time. And he's older than me. And I always looked up to him. So I thought I could call him and talk to him. He's out of state. And I said, you have fallen off the wagon. He said, ah, so what? I fall off the wagon. I jump back on the wagon. I said, man, but I'm really concerned about it. I'm going to die anyway. I said, well, could you bequeath some money to my organization? I mean, if you're going to go anyway, can I get a policy? I'll make the payment. But can you leave us something? Because, you know, we're just, we're just wasting away some of us. No, that's right. I love them. Yeah. But if you're just going to go out blazing, leave $100,000 behind. Right. We've really got to be a lot more strategic about how we play with the money. And we need it. Agreed. Agreed. Right? I don't think it's either or. It's both and. And we can do both. You know, the young lady that reached out to me from Texas, I said to her, put a core group together as a committee and give people committee assignments. But I also want you to have a council of elders because what you also need is the Joy Learys and the other folks. Not Larry, the group. No Larry. I'm sorry, the Joy DeGruz, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> you, you, need the, you need the Joy DeGruz. You can't put my business out there like I'm that. sorry, I'm sorry. You, you need them to tell you when you're wrong, mm -hmm. right? I, I know she can pick up the phone if I'm way out of pocket and say, hey, DeLacy, I love you, but you're wrong. That's what we got to have. And we don't have that. That's the, that's the last piece of this. In our community, we have to have accountability. And right. we've fallen short. We're so in love with each other that we're going to give each other a pass when we know we're wrong. I tell a brother, if you beat women, I can't be your friend. Right? right. I don't care who you are. I just can't be your friend. Okay? You're not taking care of your children and you and I can't hang out. Now, some other people may tolerate that. Because what's happening is at what point do you draw the line in the sand? Where is the accountability? I grew up in a time when if you were putting your hands on a woman, everybody beat you in that community. I've been to Ghana where it's a crime-free village and all somebody's going to come out and say thief and the entire village run you down. Like you're not stealing and getting away. But what has happened is that we've taken on the pathology of the former slave master and the children. And it's, it's showing the culture. up. It's the culture of the country. Like you said, it's in the system. When you talk about the culture of policing, it's in the culture of this fabric of this country. It's like we should be. Uh, for yourself, the individualism. We should be out for myself. I don't care about what anybody else needs. And we are raising a group. Of, you know, it's it's rough because I, for myself, looking at my children and trying to accustom them to a certain level of hardship. When you work so hard to get out of hardship, it's just a difficult thing to do because you're like, you sit there and you go, hmm, why shouldn't my children have a nice house? Why shouldn't? And you go, you don't have no sense. You got white people problems suddenly. You got white kid problems suddenly. You what? What I have to, I could have these these problems that you got right now because right. we have a, a different situation. I worked really hard to get you out of the situation, but now you don't have the, the sense that we that we gave you that that was passed down from our family about well, the struggle and why we're where we are. So it's it's hard, but I think that we're dedicated to it. We're yes. dedicated to that, and I think that um, when we start talking about young people having to get on the front lines, this is the first time I've seen them inspired. Yes, like, from their core. Because most of the time they're like, I'm not worried about it. It's not me. It's not, you know, and that's a very selfish, very, very American, rugged individualism way of looking at things. And now they're kind of going, well, if these white kids are out here <laughs> doing this, I maybe, well, let me talk to my mama. Let me talk to my grandma. Right. It's starting to do something for our kids, I've seen. And I think um, I'm just, just with my own, I'm just noticing just a different level of engagement yeah. in what's happening in the world. My daughter, Ayla, is the opera singer, my birth daughter. She said, Daddy, I had to go to the protest. New York had 10,000 people. She said, I got all of my singing friends, my opera friends, and we sang Amen, the Amen song, but they needed, she said, I needed to be there. She said, I, she said, I grew up in protest. My dad took me as a little girl. And so people ask me, are you going to the demonstration? I said, no, I'm staying home. I'm watching the young people. I'm giving good <laughs> counsel, right? And I watch them, and I'm proud of them because I think that's what it's going to take to make change. But we have to be there to help them develop Absolutely. the apparatus to, to, to move left, move right, 
but certainly let them lead this revolution that they're leading. I'm proud of this, this group of young people. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been, been wonderful. God, right off the cuff. See what I'm saying? And again, what this is, is the result of relationships, yes. not rapport. Yes. <laughs> this, is, right. this is showing up when you need to show up in the trenches. And, you know, we, we've seen a lot of stuff, the late and I, through the yes. years. Yes. Um, and been there through some real tough times. And right. I think that there are tough times ahead, but that's a, the role of being elders is, and for those of you that are my age and older, show up, that's show right. up, help, do something. Um, but thank you so much for coming on. Thank you again for um, all your sacrifices and who you are. The world is better because you're in it. For sure. And them. go back and watch her, her video because there's plenty of people who have been uh, just super uplifted by your presence here and the information you have given us, I want you to just at least receive that love. So go back on the on the Joy Degree Publications um, site on Facebook and just look look at all the love that people are giving to you and appreciate thank you. you. I thank you. I love you both. I appreciate you. And let's do this again. Yeah, call me when you need me. Okay. <laughs> call me too. I'll have some teenagers to be there too. <laughs> I'm gonna call you right here. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. See thank you, you Alex. Thank you, Alex, for hanging. Thanks, Alex. Alex. <laughs> Bye, Alex.